Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Dr. Mike Isretel. Uh, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. It's kind of like Israel, but Israel. With a, with a T in, in there, yeah, it's close enough. It, there's actually no real right way to pronounce it in English since it's like a Russian last name, so. Okay. That's awesome. good. So I'm glad I can butcher it however I want. It's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike is the chief sports scientist at Renaissance Periodization. He's a former professor of public health at Temple University. He's the author of the book, Understanding Healthy Eating. And he's a PhD, he has a PhD in sport physiology and he's been a consultant on sports nutrition to the US Olympic training team in Johnson City, Tennessee. He's also uh, a jujitsu practitioner and uh, he's won, I know, a couple a couple uh, big tournaments, the Arnold Classic Jiu-Jitsu Tournament. Is that what it's, I think it was the Arnold Classic. Right? That's correct, yes. Yes, nice. So awesome, Mike, it's been, a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been following your work for several years and I'm really a big fan of, of what you're doing and kind of how you take such an evidence-based approach to nutrition and training. And uh, really a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, uh, I'm, I'm super pumped. Yeah. So I would love to get started by just having you talk a bit about how you got into this field and, and your background and what led you to have such a, an obsessive passion about training and nutrition. Yeah. So I originally uh, began uh, wrestling when I was in high school. I think they brought a nutritionist to talk to us, but I was 15 years old, so just never, never really registered. But I knew that they, like, if you wanted to win, you had to sort of pay attention to, to making sure that stuff went in your body and it mattered. And of course, you know, nobody who's 15 really pays attention to health at all, so that was all for nothing. Uh, and then as I went to undergraduate studies, I became very passionate about getting stronger because I became a competitive power lifter. And uh, once I did that, you know, it started to be, because I was in charge of my own training, I, I had to really start learning stuff to ensure the fact that I was getting stronger at the best rates possible and staying injury free. And then as I continued to get bigger, I started to get a passion for more bodybuilding and muscle size training. And at that point, you know, you're getting bigger and um, that does uh, take a toll on your health. So I began to really look into uh, how that uh, size gain, et cetera, was affecting my health and maybe what I could do with my diet and physical activity to reduce the health impact of the sport of bodybuilding on me. And uh, at the time, I was doing a lot of personal training at various points, so I had a lot of clients that were interested in, in diet and health and physical activity. And, uh, and eventually, I became so passionate about all these things that I went through a master's program and a PhD program, became a professor of all of this stuff. Uh, so it was all started with my own pursuits and eventually went to, uh, to helping other folks uh, as best as possible. Excellent. So... You have a, so I, a lot of the work of yours that I followed is really centered around training and nutrition for body composition, mm -hmm. um, and I and I want to get into that stuff with you. But uh, I know that you've also written a book called Understanding uh, Understanding Healthy Eating, and you've really delved deep into the literature around uh, nutrition as it relates to health and disease prevention. So let's let's start with that and. You know, I think we have this this landscape of all this all these sort of competing and contradictory claims out there about the right way to eat and the best diet. And some people are saying keto, and some people are saying veganism, and some people are saying, you know, it's all about carbs and fats and macros and and calories and and sort of and 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 there's all these contradictory claims, right? People are saying, oh, gluten is the, you know, the, the scourge that's causing all disease. And other people are saying, no, gluten's really not that big of a deal. And the evidence doesn't really support that. So with all these, this landscape of competing and contradictory claims, what is your sort of overarching take about what's important when it comes to nutrition and health? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, originally, one of the reasons we started looking into this at our team at Renaissance, with several of my co-authors and I who wrote this book, is that a lot of folks um, get into nutrition for body composition, and basically that's answering the question of what makes me the leanest and most muscular, and uh, they start to become leaner, more muscular, and then of course a lot of folks have concerns with their health as well. Like one of the reasons people try to get lean is to look better, to perform better, but some folks it's really health is number one. 
And then they get into these nutrition uh, ways of understanding nutrition that optimizes how you look and how you feel, how you perform, but maybe not how good your health is doing. So we'd get a lot of questions at seminars, you know, what about for health? And we'd say, well, you know, that didn't really matter much, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, then they say, well, what about this for performance? Well, it works for performance, but maybe not the greatest thing for your health. And you know, when you tell people that, they're like, wait, hold on a second. So there's things I'm doing that make me look better and perform better that might not be the best thing for health. And they're like, well, yeah, absolutely. And so they got very curious. We got very curious. And uh, then we looked out into the landscape of literature that was available and saw mostly a very bleak picture, just as you described, of various competing absurdities uh, and extreme views that are mutually contradictory. So we looked into a ton, a ton of research. And the thing is, is relatively well-researched subjects with thousands of research papers on them. A lot of people just don't like to look at them. The results are either it's disheartening or you don't favor your pet hypothesis. But when you look into them, you, you start to develop a very, very clear picture of what's going on. And here's a very brief summary of that picture. Uh, without putting too fine a point on it, how much body fat you're carrying and in a, to some extent how much weight you're carrying is a huge determination of your risk for a variety of real major diseases and lack thereof. So, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you weigh 150 pounds and you're an average height, uh, you know, your, your risk for real nasty health detriment uh, isn't something that's greatly apparent to your doctor until he or she runs blood work. You show up to a doctor's office and you're of normal weight and they're like, all right, well, you know, you're concerned about your health. I guess you go dearly. So you know, let's run some blood work and see how the internals are looking, right? And if you show up to your doctor weighing 450 pounds, they're really not going to do blood work first. <laughs> they're going to be like, okay, this is clearly a problem, right? And there's not really a way when you're like, ooh, but I eat super healthy, right? But I, I've been staying away from gluten. They're going to say, okay, well, <laughs> you know, your weight is in excess. Why would they say that? Because the research on the link between excess body weight and health morbidities and mortality is massive, overwhelming, not even controversial. Um, and what does that mean for nutrition? It means that if you are grossly overweight or grossly underweight, your calories, the amount of food you're eating might not be a conscious priority. You might be able to change some other things about your diet to change the calorie balance, or you might be able to become more active, still eat the same amount of calories. But the calorie balance, the ratio of how much you're eating to how much you're burning off, has to change in the long term in order to bring you into a healthy body weight range. But the good news is healthy body weight ranges are not those stupid insurance tables you see people share on social media where it's like, oh, I'm 5'3", I have to weigh exactly 117 pounds. If it's 116 pounds, they're coming to get me from the hospital and force feeding me. It's 118 pounds, I'm morbidly obese, I'm just going to die tomorrow. It's a pretty wide range. It's, it's an excess of 50 pounds around every inch of height. You can be 50 pounds lighter or heavier and very, in very good health, especially granted if you are very active and eat well fundamentally. But outside of those ranges, the number one priority is calorie balance to get you back into those ranges. So if there's the biggest feature of health, if someone weighs 450 pounds, they come to you and they say, listen, I got to change my eating to be healthier. What do I do? Your answer doesn't have to verbally say reduce calories, but whatever it is has to either reduce their intake increase their expenditure, or both. That probably accounts for something like 60% of all of the variance in health we see between uh, individuals in Western countries. Like, that's it, calorie balance. Right? You point to someone who's really unhealthy, chances are their calorie balance could, could use improvement. It would have a really, really, really big effect. So that's number one. Okay. Number two... I, I want to interrupt you for a minute and, and digress on a, a little bit of a tangent, but sure. there's going to be some people listening to this who have read Gary Taubes or Jason Fung, who go, oh, this guy's talking about calories. He's clearly, you know, in the 1980s of research and he's not up to date on, on the latest science. So for those people who are, are thinking that right now, like, why is this guy talking about calories? Doesn't he know it's, it's all about carbs and insulin? W what is your response to that? I like the 1980s. I still have a Game Boy. The fashion was great. <laughs> that, was funny. that was the extent of my response. Like, oh, wow, the 80s were pretty good. <laughs> so, all right. So, is my uh, connection coming in okay? Yeah, you're great. Okay. So, uh, my response to that would be that uh, in the absence of a caloric environment uh, of excessive calories, there's no way to gain body fat in any measurable amount and ruin your health no matter what you do. So, 
uh, put this in perspective, uh, competitive bodybuilders um, will eat uh, literally uh, six, seven, eight hundred grams of carbohydrate per day, per day, okay? Uh, roughly three times the average American intake there, two to three times. And they will actually inject um, artificially designed insulin even more than they're secreting. So you would think, oh my God, recipe for fat. They'll do this while losing fat into a bodybuilding show into the low single digits. And you think, well, how in God's name is it possible that they're shooting insulin, taking in hundreds of grams of carbs and getting leaner? And the answer is they're not eating a whole lot of fats and just enough proteins to keep their calories under what their bodies need. And the thing is doing that is actually pretty dangerous because if you shoot a little too much insulin and take in not enough carbohydrate, you can go very hypoglycemic. Your blood glucose can fall so much that you risk coma or death or really, really bad stuff. So when you have an environment in which you have a high level of insulin and carbohydrate in the blood, that doesn't really mean much of anything as far as weight gain unless it comes with a whole lot of calories. Another line of disproving this logic, so to speak, is to actually examine the diets of individuals that are obese in the United States. The percent of them that eat a lot of carbohydrates is very high. The percent of them that eat too much carbohydrate is very high. The percent of them that concomitantly, at the same time, eat a very low-fat diet is pretty close to zero. We know what makes people obese. It is very delicious, hyperpalatable, they're called. Junk food, basically, if we're going to step around the issue. Super delicious foods that are high in simple processed carbohydrates and fats. Lots of fats. You can't get enormous without putting in lots of fats unless you're a competitive bodybuilder. I am currently trying to gain weight on a low-fat, high-carb diet. It's the hardest thing in the world. You should get tired of eating that much food. But if I could have a high-fat diet with high carbs, boy, oh, boy, I'd be 300 pounds right now. So it's one of those things when people say, it's the carbs. Well, it is the carbs, but only if you add a whole crap load of fat. And so, then it really looks like the calories. Okay, so let me, one more tangent on this topic, sure. which is, which is people are listening to this and saying, well, did, you know, this guy's saying low fat or, you know, reduce fat and, and that makes it m m easier to lose fat or harder to gain fat. Um, but didn't we all go low fat? Well, you know, wasn't there a whole low fat area era where everybody went low fat diets and, and lost and, and didn't lose weight and we just got fatter, you know, man, <laughs> yes. In an alternate universe, there was. So it's a very, very, very good question. And it's, uh, I would say it's a pretty common myth or misconception. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a sensical myth and misconception. It makes sense on the face of it. You know, the USDA uh, back in the 1980s and 90s uh, basically uh, said that, you know, fats are what cause obesity, which is not entirely wrong, not entirely right. And then they tried to get people to eat a low-fat diet and, and advocated one for well, you know half a generation or so. The thing is, what, what they advocate and what actually happens are two really different things. And, and the reality is, if you look at the actual data of what people were consuming, not difficult to find. Your restaurants will tabulate all their orders, and you can do surveys of consumers and what they buy in grocery stores. It turns out people never really lowered their fat intakes. They just ate more carbs. And then later they ate even more fats. And then recently they actually reduced their carbs a little bit and ate even more fats and they're still getting enormous. Right. So it was one of those things like, yeah, that was the recommendation. But boy, oh boy, you know, uh, for better or for worse, uh, most people just aren't very good at listening to government guidelines. So yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, just to add to that, we, we have that data and it's very clear. I mean, you can look, I've seen the, the actual charts where they show that fat, intake, average fat intake did not actually decline at all. And in fact, in, in absolute terms, went up slightly during that time. But people added so many calories from especially refined carbohydrates and maybe even low fat sort of refined carbohydrate rich foods that the calorie percentage um, in, in relative terms of fat lowered slightly during yeah, that time. For time. Well, absolute actual grams of fat intake increased slightly. And so there, there are people out there who are misrepresenting that and saying, oh, everybody went low fat and just got fatter. So Yeah, and you could skip that whole process altogether and just look at straight up calories. If you look at calories per, per, per capita, they've just been going up for a real long time. I mean, that's, that's culprit number one. 
there's just really not a situation in which folks are controlling their, you know, so uh, there's a camp and some of those folks are in that camp. Um, there's more nuanced, there's a less nuanced one. Less nuanced one says that, you know, calories don't matter, it's all hormones. That's uh, mildly absurd because there's never been a person who manipulated their hormones properly and with not enough calories managed to gain weight and ruin their health. Uh, there's, there's literally no such human being uh, can exist. If that person could do that, please tell me. I don't know why I'm starving for bodybuilding shows over here. I would love to be able to eat a ton of calories and lose weight or the other way around. I'm sick of stuffing myself. I'd love to gain weight without eating a ton of calories. The more nuanced version is that when you eat a lot of carbohydrate, a, lot, a very insulin-secreting environment, uh, it makes you take in more calories because it makes you hungrier. I mean, there's some semblance of truth to that. There's some value there. Uh, but the first opinion is just wildly wrong. The second one has something to it, but and I can expand on that if you like. It's a, it's, it's more nuanced than they say. I, I want to get into that more, but maybe we'll come we'll come back to that because I, I don't want to digress too much from you know the, sure. we've the the first key point as far as nutrition for health is sure. calorie balance basically and and yeah. maintaining relative leanness and not letting yourself get gigantic, extremely overweight. So. <laughs> We went on some digressions, me guiding those digressions uh, into the, those tangents. So let's, let's get back to number two. What's the second big factor beyond uh, energy balance? Yeah. So the second big factor is going to be food composition. It accounts for roughly 20% in our estimate of the variance in health between individuals. And food composition means, okay, you, you know, you, you're basically eating proteins, carbs, and fats. Those are your macronutrients. And, um, where are you getting them from? Like where, what kind of food are you eating? Granted that you're getting, let's say, 2,000 calories a day. But are they 2,000 calories a day of, you know, like fry grease from McDonald's, um, you know, bologna, <laughs> and, you know, sugar cubes? Or is it 2,000 calories a day of lean chicken or tofu and broccoli and you know almond oil or something like that now the the real critical factor here is 20 percent is a lot less than 60 percent so what you never want to do is start quote unquote eating healthy and tell yourself it doesn't matter how much i eat or what my body weight is i'm eating the right stuff but you also don't want less so but you still don't want it is to, to know that you're at a healthy body weight and just eat God knows what, because if you want your best health, and you know, best health doesn't strike people in their 20s and 30s much. When your kids start getting a little older in your 40s, you go, oh, man, I kind of want to be around for all this stuff. Then it starts, the details might start to matter a little bit more. Or the doctor says, you know how you've always been pretty healthy? You're like, uh-huh. He's like, that's just not true anymore. Your blood work came back and you suck. You know, you're like, oh, crap. That 20% can start to matter. And that 20%, I mean, the recommendation there is consume most of your foods, most, not all, you don't have to be religious about it, most of your foods from a combination of lean protein sources, uh, uh, basically, you know, like uh, poultry and meats or what have you, or uh, they can be vegan protein sources as well, uh, in the following order, veggies, fruits, whole grains for carbohydrates uh, with minimum processed stuff. And then primarily healthy fats, you want to get uh, sort of healthy uh, fish and omega-3 fatty acids, but you also want the majority of your fats outside of that to probably come from a lot of monounsaturated heavy sources, olive oil, canola oil, nut butters, nuts, avocado, stuff like that. The good stuff, right? Can you have some ice cream? Can you have some cookies? Totally. But if maybe like three quarters of your food comes from stuff you know is healthy, that's probably a really good idea for your health. The here thing is with consistency on average over the long term. If you have a weekend here or there where you eat like total crap, your body weight doesn't go down a ton or it comes back down, it's okay. As long as day in, day out, your weekly routine has mostly healthy foods. Uh, back when I taught this uh, kind of subject matter at a university, and we actually had an entire course about teaching my students how to help other people make their healthy, uh, make their eating more healthy, one of the best ways to attack this problem is, is get folks to figure, you know, like going out to birthday parties, whatever, you eat whatever you want. I mean, you know, if, if there's, if you're going to watch what you're eating at a birthday party and you're not on like a mission to lose a ton of fat because your health is real bad, if you're just trying to be healthy and you're okay, like, you know, we live in a totalitarian society, then it's nothing's worth it at all, right? But 
it, you know, where you can really work on it is, what are you eating for breakfast? What are you eating for lunch? And is your dinner at least decently healthy? Like, can you have some ice cream after dinner every now and again? Totally. But like, if you're, uh, you know, you, you choose what you eat for lunch, you definitely choose what you eat for breakfast, mostly choose what you eat for dinner. Make it good stuff. And the thing about people ask what's good stuff, that Understanding Healthy Eating book has all the definitions. And like I said, you know, lean proteins, uh, veggies, fruits, whole grains, uh, healthy fats. But the thing is, I'll tell you this, Ari, I think nine out of 10 people, no matter the socioeconomic status, demographic, you give them two foods side by side, you say which one's healthy, which one's not, they're going to be able to tell you. It's not rockets. There's nowhere in America where you whip out a cheeseburger or a shake and you whip out a fruit or like a platter of nuts and greens and you're like, which one's healthy? And they're like, cheeseburger. That just doesn't happen. Everybody knows. Hey, to the extent that they care, different people care about different things. To the extent that they would still eat the cheeseburger, totally, right? But people know. So when people are like, what's healthy? Like, what do you think's healthy? And they're like, I know, but I don't always like to eat that stuff. Listen, nobody does. You got to develop a healthy eating habit. Before that, it all tastes man, like health food, and it's just not going to taste. What is it? Dr. Spencer Rodolsky says, um, you know, nothing tastes as good as candy. So you just forget about finding anything that good. Be an adult. Choose your food wisely for the most part and go from there. Great. So I, I want to come back to your percentages and ask a couple of questions around that. Um, so you've kind of given this 60% is about energy balance and, and body composition. 20% uh, is about food choices. Yeah. So is your, so when we look at like the links between junk food consumption, um, process, highly processed foods, refined grains, refined sugars, fatty mm -hmm. foods, mixes of highly palatable, highly rewarding foods that are usually a mix of sugar and fat and starch or salt or some combination of those. The good stuff. Yeah. Uh, ice cream, pizza, potato chips, donuts, you know, things like yep. that. Um, what is it specifically in your opinion that makes those things unhealthy? Is it primarily just about the fact that they make you, they, they don't work with your hunger and satiety hormones very well and cause you to passively overconsume food and then therefore get out of calorie balance and gain fat over time? Or uh, do they also mediate damaging effects through effects on the gut microbiome or immune dis dysregulation or, um, you know, kind of inflammation in the body? Are, 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 how big of a factor are other mechanisms uh, beyond just the, the effects on calorie balance? Yeah. Well, I think uh, a big part of the answer is in that 60% uh, to 20% ratio. So like, what is that? Three to one, right? Hopefully my math's not that far off. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, if you take out the effects of those foods at boosting calories, you lose 75% of their negative health effects. Okay. For example, if somebody eats a diet mostly of junk food, almost entirely, but they keep calorie balance, they'll be free from roughly 75% of the adverse health effects of those junk foods. This has actually been proven several times. That the most uh, notable incident was a case study by one of the professors of our colleagues, actually, that works with me at Renaissance Periodization, Dr. Jen Case. She had a PhD in nutrition um, under a gentleman who, who coined the sort of Twinkie diet. Right, um, yeah, that's I was going to mention. Yeah, he, was at a, he was at a meeting with other professors, and he got on a little bit of a tangent with them in a discussion about like calorie balance is super important. And they're like, no, that's ridiculous. And I think they were harassing him for having like a Twinkie at lunch or something with other food. He's like, I bet you guys I can eat all, all basically only snack cakes with a little bit of essential nutrients and some protein thrown in. I can do this for months and I'll lose weight and improve every health parameter. And they're like, no way. And he did it. And he, sure enough, it worked. Right? And there's been documentaries of guys eating McDonald's and losing a bunch of weight, losing fat, improving their health. It can be done. It's a ridiculous way to go about things. Uh, the, the hunger dysregulation makes it almost impossible because if you eat like 2,000 calories of Twinkies, you're just going to want to eat 4,000 more calories of junk food after that. There's no way you can, uh, most people can, can be, you know, have any satiety like that. But most of the health effects are, in fact, calorie related. Not all of them especially in proportion to how much of your intake is composed of those foods. For example, if you have like a, a Coca-Cola, full sugar Coke, and a cheeseburger, 
once a week or twice a week or three times a week, and it's within the context of a calorie controlled diet and the rest of your food is healthy. If someone comes up to you and they're like, do you know what fructose does to your body? Like it's killing your cells right now and you've got dysbiosis or some word they sort of cursorily know, but not really. You're just loading just a bunch of crap and shooting it at you. It's nonsense, right? There's not going to be any kind of effects that are medically detectable from that sort of thing. Now, if a really big part of your diet, even though you're a skinny person, you know, some people are just naturally thin. They just control calories through a lot of just excess energy expenditure. They're always kind of jittery. They're just kind of move around. But they have a total crap diet. Yeah, they're actually going to have um, uh, elevated markers of inflammation, of those kind of nasty low-level systemic inflammation that causes heart disease later down the line. Uh, they might have some blood pressure control issues. Uh, their lipids are going to be off, uh, definitely off of what you would expect based on their composition, right? Like, you know, if you think every lean person is healthy, uh, go ahead and find some drug addicts on the street that are very lean, and you'll do their blood work. You'll quickly find out that this is absolutely not the case. Ask them what their diets are like, and well, holy crap, you just sort of eat whatever, you know, you happen to buy at a convenience store, and that stuff will add up. Yeah. So, so hopefully that starts to kind of give, give a picture of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Yes, these uh, fructose-mediated effects, um, uh, highly processed sugars, uh, the uh, possible potential effects on gut uh, microbiota, um, they're definitely real. Uh, they're not enormous until you start eating a diet of very, very high in those foods and low in nutritious foods. That being said, it's almost an esoteric, it's curious to uh, you and I as we're nerds, um, that debate, so to speak, is, is very uh, not super relevant because almost everyone who eats a lot of those foods is hypercaloric mm -hmm. and is overweight. Right. So when you reduce those foods, it's a one-two punch to both sides of the problem, both the sort of chemically mediated effects and the caloric effect. So, okay. so, mm -hmm. so, so let me follow up on this with the example of what, what the, the concept of metabolically healthy obese people. What, what do you think of that concept? Is it possible to be in a calorie surplus, accumulate body fat, you know, significant amounts of body fat over the course of years and years and years, be actually very overweight and yet be perfectly healthy still? Multi-part answer to that one. First of all, a lot of those folks are abusing unicorn dust and I'm still trying to get some. It's really difficult to find actual unicorn dust. Unicorns are tough to find to begin with with the dust. I don't even know if it's ethical. Is it crushed up unicorns? I don't know what it is, but it works. If you consume it, then you're just healthy no matter what. All right. So now we got the unicorn dust out of the way. Uh, two, part, two part answer. The first part uh, is uh, the less relevant part or the less uh, explains less of the variance, but it's nonetheless, I think, important to point out. Some folks just have gnarly genetics for health and they can do whatever. So is gnarly, is gnarly the proper scientific term for that? Literally, your Journal of Clinical Nutrition, gnarly is defined as, you know, <laughs> highly robust, uh, <laughs> intractable health, right? So some people just have really good health genetically, and boy, oh boy, is learning from them a real bad idea for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, one of my coaches, his grandfather um, worked in the coal mines basically his entire life, and he ate essentially almost exclusively saturated fat and drank heavily, um, lived in, I think, West Virginia or something like that. He was angry his entire life. And at one point, he got sick and because uh, he was working in the coal mines and breathing God knows what. And uh, the doctor, this was back in the 60s, prescribed him daily Dianabol. Like, that's an anabolic steroid. Wow. It's oral, it's supposed to be taken for only weeks at a time if you're an you know, HIV patient or something like that to spark you back to life. Highly degrading, kills people. This guy took hundreds of milligrams of Dianabol for pretty much every week of his life there on after. Wow. Uh, 
and, and lived into his, I think, mid-70s. And by my coach's account, uh, he was healthy the entire time, muscular for no good reason, working in a coal mine. I, I can think right. of at least one good reason why he was muscular. If he was <laughs> oh, sorry, right, for sure. <laughs> Taking lots of bad about helping be muscular. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and then, and then uh, the way that my uh, coach describes, the, the way he died was he just got fed up with life and just checked out. He didn't, there was no degradation. He wasn't like super weak and then, you know, flowed it away he was just like ah whatever <laughs> it just that's it he was it was angry all the time the anger also possibly explainable by the animal so what can we learn from a gentleman like that one thing for sure some people just have unbelievable genetics for health and, and most of us don't have unbelievable genetics for health the rest of us are on a bell curve it's a spectrum right some people are decent some people require a lot more management some folks will be pretty unhealthy no matter what they do even if they stay on everything and it's tough if you have that. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. So we got to just make sure that if, if there's case reports of people that are very overweight and have perfect health, you got to, you got to, you know, some of them are for sure just gifted, right? Mm -hmm. But that explains maybe 5% or something like that of, of all those folks. 95% is a little bit more of a nefarious sort of explanation. And here it is. If you are metabolically relatively healthy, if you're one of those pretty healthy people, and especially if you're relatively young, if you gain a considerable amount of weight in your childhood, teen, or early 20s and 30s, um, once you have gained the weight, you may still be fairly metabolically healthy and resilient. But the thing is, is that that excess weight due to the physical stress, the hormonal dysregulation, so on and so forth, is a, I don't wanna say time bomb, that's kind of inaccurate, um, it slowly leaches away and degrades your health. Now, how long does that take? Sometimes it can take years if you've a pretty good, uh, robust health to begin with. Sometimes it can take a decade or more. So if someone, you know, used to be pretty physically active, just has great genetics for health, was a healthy body weight, after college, they put on a lot of weight. Now they weigh 300 pounds, you know, five foot six, you know, college graduations at age 22. It might be until their mid 30s until they actually see any kind of blood work ramifications. Cause you know, there's some people walking around there, stellar blood work. My wife, um, I think her average resting blood pressure is like a hundred over 60. Like I have no idea how she's physically upright and not passed out all the time. Like if she took a turn for the worse with her health or behaviors, um, she's actually a medical doctor, so there's no way that's happening. But um, you know, it would take years, years, years for her blood pressure to register as abnormally high. It would just be like the biggest uphill battle of all time. Yeah. So a lot of those folks end up, uh, you know, going years and years and years without paying the price. Every single one of them, except for those people that you know work in coal mines and eat anabol tabs, <laughs> every single one of them will pay the price eventually. And once the uh, once the, the the debt collector comes as far as degraded health that is an accumulated degradation of health there's not an easy way to reverse that versus losing the weight getting super healthy and keeping it like that for a long time and sometimes there's no reversing it at all it's just damage done um so when investigators collect data about who's fit who's fat and how healthy they are if they profile those folks that are in their 20s and 30s have really good, pretty good health genetics but have put on a lot of weight uh, they're going to notice this fit uh, yet fat group and they're going to say, oh, looks like that's okay, but it's not okay. It, it's like a car that hasn't got an oil change in a long time, but it's still in the safe range. They'll be like, well, this car hasn't had an oil changer forever, uh, but it's still running. It, is the conclusion there that we never, never need to change our oil? God, no. It, the conclusion is quite the opposite, but we wouldn't be able to tell that given the way we're looking at the problem. Gotcha. Yeah, beautifully explained. So um, is there a number three factor? And, and, you know, I, if not, I have sp some specific questions that Please. we can dig into, but um, carbs and fats and protein. So we have several claims around these, for example, uh, obviously low carb and keto have become very popular and still the idea that, you know, kind of carbs and insulin are not only making us fat, but are, are key drivers of, of aging and disease is still very prevalent. We need to go keto. You know, that's a very popular thing right now. Uh, we also have a lot of vegans out there who are saying, hey, we need to avoid animal proteins and eat low protein diets to keep IGF-1 low and, and because that's a key driver and, and mTOR low because those are key mechanisms of aging and, and disease. So 
what do you say in response to those claims? What's your take on carbs, fats, and proteins as they pertain to health? Yeah. Well, gee, you, you beat me to the number three factor, which is macronutrient balance, right? Or macronutrient ratios. And that's how much protein, carbs, and fats compose your calories and healthy, hopefully foods. And what effect does that have? So the first part of the answer is really the biggest. The net total in our estimate of effects from the different kind of macronutrient ratios is about 10%. And that's total effect on health. And, and notice we already have the 60% from calories and the 20% from the composition, that's 80% of the way there as far as a healthy diet. If you can do 80% with good consistency, honestly, that's almost everything any medical professional can ask of you. I mean, like if you're a nutritionist, if you have a nutritionist or a doctor and he knows that you're doing calories and you know, or, or mostly healthy foods properly, but they really can't, it would just be crazy to ask you to do much more than that. If, I'll put it to you this way. If all of the Western world, uh, America included, went to 80% only, didn't worry about anything else, but did it consistently, uh, our public health uh, you know, disasters would pretty much dry up almost completely, almost completely. We'd cut healthcare spending by like 10th or something, some, some, or by 10th, by 9 tenths, right? It would just be like this huge revolution. So 10% is it's a very small number, and, and here's why. Um, so long as you get the minimum amounts of proteins, carbs, and fats, to operate your body and keep it healthy, which is a very different thing than keeping it, performing at a high level of muscle, et cetera. And, and this is where those things kind of split apart a, a lot. Um, if you get enough proteins, carbs, and fats for the minimum basics, you can fill up the rest of your calories with any real combination of carbs, proteins, and fats, so long as they're mostly from healthy sources and the calories are good to go. Boy, it matters just very, very little. It matters so little that it becomes really difficult for the the researcher to start to really delete what it is exactly uh, uh, that we can conclude is like the optimal healthy diet, right? And I, I, I want to interrupt you for a second and just emphasize a, a point that you're making, which is if we look at the last 15, 20, maybe 30 years of talk around the diet that is optimal for health or the diet that is optimal for body composition, almost at least in the outside of scientific circles, but more in, you know, the general public sphere, um, almost all of the conversation is centered around carbs and fats. It's like, it's carbs. No, it's fats. Go low fat, go low carb, go keto, Every, you know, or, or protein to some extent with kind of the, the vegan people. Um, but it's very, very carb and fat centric. And we've, you know, like everybody's it's, thinking is really centered around carbs and fats as the key mover and shaker that determines our health and our body composition. And I just wanna point out, emphasize that you're saying that that carb to fat ratio is probably about 10% of the overall picture when it, when it comes to health. Yeah, if not less. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, once you, once you exclude, you know, protein consumption, we're talking maybe 7%, I don't know, something, um, it, it's, uh, and, and, maybe, and maybe less actually. Yeah. Most of the way we generate that 10% figure is, uh, you know, uh, kind of accounting for people deviating a little too far away from, from Optima. For example, if you use a strict keto diet, you gotta be real careful about getting in your vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and fiber, because most of those come in through plant foods, and you reduce your carbs a lot, plant foods low, lower and then you're, you're looking at some trouble. If you're a strict vegan, uh, it becomes a little bit different, difficult to get certain kinds of fats that are considered essential fats. So if people err two side on one or another, they start to get into some health concerns, but within the minima, uh, it's, even, it's even less than a 10% difference. Um, and then it comes down to, I think, uh, you know, uh, a real, I don't know, I can say controversy, but it's just not clear from the evidence. For example, let, let's refute some of the common sort of thinking on this. Uh, to the individuals that think that carbohydrates are the cause of a lot of health maladies, we present to you the statistical category in nutrition called vegans and vegetarians. In many surveys, they consume in excess of 70%, sometimes up to 80% of their daily calories in carbohydrate, which boy, oh boy, if the you know, carb insulin hypothesis is as real as some folks think. Maybe they should just be dead bodies in these places. I mean, these, these should be the most unhealthy people in the world. The thing is, um, in the many, especially older analyses, I'll get to the newer analyses in a bit, um, 
vegans and vegetarians are some of the healthiest people ever studied. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they don't have a dominant philosophy on health. Maybe there's other ways of eating, and there are that are just as healthy or close. But if carbs and insulin really were as bad as people say, they couldn't be one of the healthiest. They could just be average maybe in some other weird way to explain it. But geez, one of the healthiest, that's tough to describe. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, folks say the high-protein diet is real bad for your health. Well, if you look at uh, fitness enthusiasts that consume high-protein diets, uh, they, uh, they're really healthy, super healthy. But if you take away the ones that abuse anabolic steroids and you look at everybody else as a big correction factor, uh, man, the high-protein diet fitness enthusiasts are some of the healthiest people, period, right? Um, and then, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, some, some sort of more uh, – so, sometimes it comes from vegans and saying, you know, a high-fat diet's real bad for your health. Well, there's folks following a mostly keto approach eating tons of – of fats, uh, you know, mostly healthy fats, and still getting enough greens and proteins and stuff, they're also super duper healthy, and a lot of people lose a lot of weight and get real healthy eating like that. So any extreme approach that seeks to say, okay, uh, certainly carbs or fats or proteins are bad. There's a group of people eating a lot of that, that is a large group of people, that's very well studied for a very long time, and they're just not dying off or having all these bad health problems. Uh, and, and that's really the simple fact of the matter and everything in between. So, you know, people say, well, carbs are okay, fats are okay, just don't eat both of them together. Like, I mean, a lot of people eat both of them together. You're basically saying that the, the follow, like a meal of salmon, uh, raw almonds, brown rice, and uh, mixed greens is unhealthy because it has a high combination of fats. Are you crazy? Every time we study people that eat like that, they outlive everybody, you know? So, so it's one of the situations where, you know, can we say that eating a higher protein diet probably degrades health in some ways? Probably. But the vegan's probably onto something with that. It probably uh, is, has an effect on mortality to eat a higher protein diet. Uh, on the other hand, it has an opposite effect on morbidity. People who eat high protein diets die of strokes strong as hell, just taking a walk and just boom, stroking out and falling over, and they're in the middle of gardening or taking a walk or riding their bike or something like that. If you eat a real low-protein diet, you die 20 years of bed rest later in a nursing home as you began to be too weak to take care of yourself 20 years ago when you were already under muscle. But, hey, you lived a long time. Good for you. So when you take into account morbidity and mortality, and I think it's also important to take into account quality of life indices, but yeah, you can design the optimal diet it's going to drain all of the fun out of everything and live some number of some short number of years longer, or a little less morbidity. I don't know, man. What's the point of that? Like, remember those, you know, you're 90 years old. And remember those memories you have pasta night with your family and everyone's laughing and the world just couldn't be any better. Nope. Cause you didn't have pasta night cause you didn't eat pasta cause it was really bad for you. Is <laughs> all of a sudden a lot of the best things in life are just, they just mixed right out. Uh, so when you integrate quality of life, it just becomes, you know, Eating in the calories, uh, proper amount of calories. Eating, you know, in, uh, the mostly healthy foods. Eating enough proteins, carbs, and fats, which really actually it's actually about ten percent of your calories for each one, roughly. Uh, and then whatever else you fill that in with is really it just in it just washes out on that balance. And let me let me make another really quick point. A lot of people will say it's actually something I was thinking about earlier. They'll say, you know, man, we've got these studies on protein and mTOR and this and that, it's really bad. I'm like, if that's gonna matter. In the big picture for you, your consistency and adherence better be like 99% to all the other stuff. Your calories better be flawless, and you better consume almost exclusively healthy food. Like, I can't believe how many folks I've seen be like mTOR and protein, and you're, it's gonna, you're gonna die, and then take like a shovel-sized spoon of natural peanut butter and jam it down, and you're like, so your calories? And they're like, well, I'm eating healthy, and you're like, Right on, you know, or eating like vegan chocolate chip cookies or something. Like food composition is terrible. And you're like, okay, well, you know, the amount that the mTOR protein thing is harming you is like this. And the amount you're doing with calories is like bigger than my screen and the amount of food composition is here. So if folks want to get super in-depth on their diet, yeah, that stuff may be worth a consideration, trading off the morbidity stuff, of course. But uh, most folks, it's just one of those things that, 
I think people have almost this kind of uh, a hypochondria about health claims where they read an article that says protein causes mTOR, which causes cancer, and they go, oh crap, oh crap, I gotta eat less protein. Like, no, you gotta eat a calorically balanced diet with mostly healthy foods. Then you have to shut up for a while, let your health improve, and then if you're just unbelievable, like the million dollar man of nutrition and you never make mistakes, you can start thinking about protein and all that stuff. That, that's kind of my take on it. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, just to play devil's advocate on one thing you said, I, I wanna present the polar opposite of you know, this, this picture that you created of like somebody who's kind of um, very, very on it as far as adhering to very healthy habits and then kind of like giving them permission to say, hey, indulge, have some pasta once in a while, have some ice cream, have some cake once in a while. What about the other side of this where uh, a, a person is constantly using this as justification for um, poor eating habits? And it's like, well, I'd, I'd rather, you know, live my life and just, you know, eat what I want to eat uh, and have cake and ice cream and pizza because eating healthy food and being judicious about my food choices is just too painful and restrictive and I'm, I'll, you know, I'll be suffering all the time. I'd rather live a shorter life um, with more disease, but I get to actually enjoy my food. What, what do you say to someone like that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Um... I think the suffering less is an interesting use of verbiage, which we will begin to examine immediately. When your uh, fifth toe in as many months is being amputated because you're diabetic, uh, it won't seem like you're suffering very little anymore. And uh, just when you're finally making enough money that you've paid off all of your debts, that your children are finally growing into the beautiful people you always knew they could become, you are starting to break apart. You have no idea why and the doctors can't help you. If that sounds like a great way to live, hell yeah. Eat whatever the hell you want, you're gonna be great. It's gonna be exactly the life you want. So, and, and to be honest, some people, uh, they, they're okay making really interesting trade-offs. I'm here talking to you right now, it weighing 260 pounds, knowingly degrading my health for the sport of bodybuilding. But knowingly, very knowingly, profoundly knowingly, wrote a whole textbook on it knowingly. I know what I'm trading off. I know almost exactly how many years I'm trading off and exactly the kind of morbidity, morbidities I'm going to be getting myself into. A lot of people just don't know that. So if somebody is really well informed on exactly what's waiting for them uh, with the free range lifestyle, so to speak, and they still say yes, they're either way too young or immature to process what's going on or enlightened and are making an interesting trade-off that I think everyone in a free society should be allowed to make. Uh, oh, it's nice. that's, that's, a, that's a very generous option <laughs> right? that you gave. <laughs> There's people like that. 90% here, 10% here in that last group. I, I, but, but the thing is, once people find out that uh, health and eating is or eating is so important for long-term health. They start to change their tune most of the time, and that's a real thing. Another uh, thing I used to teach in that class where I taught folks how to change other people's health behaviors or help them do that. Uh, what you never want to do is help someone eat a healthy diet and really trump up the short-term benefits especially the perceptive benefits. Like, don't you just feel great eating broccoli and chicken? Nine out of 10 people who have been eating Taco Bell and all this other stuff their whole life are like, no, I feel terrible, I hate it, right? So like, some people say like, I've been following a healthy diet and I feel so good. Like at Renaissance, we read a ton of healthy diets and it's always nice to us, but kind of in the back of our heads, we're like, Ugh. when people are like, I've been following the templates for a week and I feel great. We're like, really? <laughs> I, that's nice. Just total coincidence. Usually it's a, it's a fat loss diet. You're supposed to feel worse. Hmm. The real health benefits of healthy eating kick in months later, years later, decades later. And it's stuff that doesn't happen to you versus stuff that does. Like yeah. If you eat healthy in your 30s and 40s, your 50s will be largely uneventful. If you don't, your 50s will be very eventful in exactly the way that you don't want them to be. Yeah. Once people hear it like that, they're a little less apt to choose the laissez-faire approach with their own diet. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I asked you that because your way of, of speaking about that issue of kind of like whole foods versus, you know, kind of indulging here and there is, I think, directed you're used to speaking to audience to audiences of people who are, are fitness fanatics yep. and who are maybe on the, the 
to a large extent on the extreme of like eating extremely healthy food and yes. oftentimes orthorexic. Hundred like percent. I can't ever have you know any cake or ice cream because it's it's terrible for me or it's going to make me fat. So you're kind of giving people permission to do that, but. There's also, I, and I've encountered a pretty sizable portion of the population of like the general population who's not, they're not fitness fanatics, they're not health fanatics, who do genuinely feel that way where they're like, I'd rather get to enjoy what I eat and, you know, and, and have that pleasure than suffer all the time by having to eat whole foods, you know? Yeah. You will suffer. You will suffer if you choose that path, you'll suffer a lot more. Um, yeah, it's a very good point. Um, I think that's one of the, when we talk about how to change people's behaviors, I think that's a really good time to sort of bring back something I said earlier, which is, you know, there's times and places to enjoy your life eating tasty foods. I'm sorry uh, for swearing, but that shit is not all the time. Yeah. You know, if, if you're eating fast food for breakfast, lunch, and donuts for dinner, you're not living your best life. You're just making really terrible choices. If you go out with your family on a Saturday night and you have some nachos and fried chicken at the movies, you're just living great. And during the week, if you're having just healthy, basic meals that you bring with you to work and a good, healthy breakfast and lunch and dinner, you're doing a great thing. So it's one of those times where people are like, I want to enjoy myself. Well, you sure as hell seem to enjoy yourself every conceivable meal. Your life's just all enjoyment all the time. It's almost I, like someone being like, I don't want a job because I want to enjoy myself all the time. Well, right. But not having a job leads to very short periods of enjoyment until you don't have any money left over. Yeah. I think also the concept of hedonic adaptation is interesting. Just that the, what we know is that people actually normalize to whatever their typical, you know, in this case, diet is. So the, if you actually were able to measure the amount of pleasure that someone's getting from eating donuts and cookies and ice cream and pizza all the time versus someone like you who's having brown rice and salmon and broccoli, let's say, um, the actual enjoyment is not actually that different. You probably enjoy those meals and they enjoy their meals. You know, it's, it, you've, you've normalized to it and you don't get this extreme pleasure all the time by eating donuts and cookies and ice cream. You know what I mean? hundred percent. That's actually how with bodybuilders that have, um, that's how we know that your body's starting to resist you gaining any more weight when you're pushing it forward. Right after you're very lean and you lose a lot of weight, when you start gaining weight, you're like cookies and ice cream and all that stuff tastes like only drugs can make you feel. It's, it's, you know, sublime. Yeah. When you gained all the weight back from after your contest and you're rushing into a new high body weight, man, someone's like, hey, you want to you want a cheat meal tonight? And you're like, okay, like, what do you want to eat? I don't know. I've literally had to, I, I was, you know, friends with uh, a lot of my, uh, my friends are bodybuilders. And, and one guy was gaining weight, one of my colleagues actually at Renaissance. And I was like, James, what do you want to eat tonight? I was on a diet. He was massing, right? So uh, I was vicariously eating through him. And I was like, he was like, I don't know. And I was like, Taco Bell. And he's like, all right. We arrived at Taco Bell and I basically had to help him order because he just didn't care what he ate. It was nothing was bringing him pleasure anymore. And I had to talk him into eating all this stuff. And you would think Taco Bell is delicious, but for him, he had been intentionally putting on weight for so long, soaking up both the calories and the hedonic uh, power of those foods that he just tapped out on it. So I think some people fear like, oh, but I'm never going to have tasty foods ever again. Well, once you get used to eating the healthier foods, uh, they're going to be pretty good actually. Like I love my healthy foods and there's also, there's ways to make healthy foods taste amazing. So it's not an excuse anymore nowadays. And also, you know, when you do have your little bits on the weekends and in the evenings every now and again, junk food will taste better than it ever has. If you're used to eating healthy food, if, because some people junk food just tastes like regular food. You'll actually have more fun eating if you eat well, most of the time. Um, really quick analogy to that. If you're always on vacation, uh, they actually, there's some pretty good studies showing that lottery winners are no happier than the average person. Like if you're always on vacation, uh, you, it's not vacation anymore. It's just regular life and you get used to it. But if you work really hard, vacations are super fun. And there's that balance in life that can be achieved through food and it's a really good one. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So I think there's a fourth factor here, just by virtue of simple math. We have 60% energy balance, calorie balance. 20% food quality, food choices, whole foods versus processed foods, 10% um, macronutrients, protein, carbs, and fats, and there's another 10% there. Yeah. 
split into two factors, actually three if you want to get technical. First one accounting for 5% is nutrient timing. The second one and third one accounting for 2.5 respectively is hydration and supplementation because the supplementation is a big factor in eating. You know, people say, should I be taking, you know, fish oil? Should I be taking this and that? Is it going to make me healthier? And of course, the supplement industry would love for everyone to believe that supplementation accounts for 60% of differences in health uh, rather than, right, 90 to 100, uh, you know, oh, you know, not 100, 95. You shouldn't eat junk food too often, but here, take this pill and you can eat most of it. Um, you know, it's not the 2.5 they want you to believe. And then, of course, hydration plays a role. We don't have to talk about hydration much at all. Just avoid extremes. If you're drinking water every hour like it's a health elixir, stop. Hyperhydration does not make you healthier. If you just go hours not drinking water and you're peeing tea color, that's not a good thing. Get more fluids. That's all we have to say about hydration. You can ask me more questions about it if you want. It's a relatively uninteresting subject. <laughs> yeah, most, I mean, most people have the idea with that one. Pretty straight. Most people are fine, actually. Most people are. people. That's another really interesting myth is people think like, oh, man, like, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm sure you get this a lot. And you're like, okay. And they're like, i got to really start worrying about hydration. Huh? And you're like, no, the hell told you that? It's one of those things that just keeps floating around. Like, i got to get in lots of water. And you're like, why? Like, flush use, out my toxins. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> or, or use electrolyte supplements. Oh, boy, yeah. Just flush it all out or something like that. Yeah. So hydration aside, supplements we can get to later. But the thing is, this is nothing really that, that 2.5%. We can only talk about for so much. Nutrient timing is 5%. And there's some stuff to say there. Um, so yeah, let's get, let's get into that. What what is optimal nutrient timing? Yeah. So first of all, it's five percent. So by definition, it really doesn't matter that much. Um, the most important thing with nutrient timing for health is that you eat in a way that supports a high level of physical activity. Because physical activity, there's a whole pyramid of physical activity in health, and uh, that is a huge huge effect on health. How much physical activity do the more the better, generally speaking. So you want to eat in a way that promotes high levels of physical activity and because it's not all about health, there's the rest of your life in a way that promotes good cognitive function, moods and energy levels that are conducive to you. Oops, seeing your kids and not trying to kill your boss <laughs> or not sleeping at work or something like that or staring at a spreadsheet like this. You haven't had uh, food in a day and a half, you have no idea what you're typing. <laughs> Your boss is like, what did you type today? What did you, what did you produce today? You're like, I think I hit the O button about 10,000 times. You're like, that's great. You're a great worker, right? <laughs> so if you could avoid all of those things, nutrient timing for health. Now, for athletics, it's 10%, and it's some more detail to talk about. It's largely uninteresting, I'm sure, to your audience. Um, but for nutrient timing for health, you know, uh, they've studied uh, folks that consume six, eight, ten meals per day if they have all the other big parts of the picture, stunningly healthy. They've studied mm -hmm. folks who do uh, daily intermittent fasting, so maybe 16 hours of fasting in the day and, you know, eight hours of feeding, and they've studied a four-hour feeding window and a two-hour feeding window. And believe it or not, as much as the bodybuilding side of my soul is pained by this, if it's not very great for bodybuilding, uh, it's actually just fine for your health and there's some unique health benefits there, and mostly canceled out by the unique health detriments, but it's just fine. And then they've actually studied uh, pretty extensively uh, daily uh, alternating fasting. Uh, so you literally one day you eat, the next day you don't. One day you eat, the next day you don't. And they found that that is actually quite conducive to health. Uh, the, the, the big reservation I have about recommending those things, as soon as I say that, people are like, so I can do that, right? And it's like, yeah, you, know, you probably go to work. I don't know if anyone's ever been to work where they haven't eaten the whole day, but boy, oh boy, does that get to be really unproductive in a very irritating environment after a while. Um, and you might go through work just fine, and then you got to see your kids later. Right, and they're yelling at you, Mommy, Mommy, what are we having for dinner? Well, Mommy's not having anything for dinner today because it's an alternate fasting day. <laughs> Collapse in front of your children as they're eating chicken nuggets. A real bad thing. So, so if you're into that lifestyle, if you're on some kind of spiritual journey and I'll do an alternate fast, it's totally great. But for the most folks, three, uh, you know, two, two to five meals per day, roughly evenly spread, some good protein and, and veggies in most of those meals and some carbs and fats when necessary or when, when desired. Um, that's really probably like the middle ground that just through adherence and lifestyle applies to most people. But if you really want to get quirky with the timing, there's probably no reason you can't do it. Okay. So 
a, a couple things. One, I wanted to get into uh, training. I, we're, I think we're going to have to save that for part two with you. Sure. I'd love to have you on the show again because I know I you have much more to easy, share yeah. on the topic of training, and we haven't even really gotten in that deep to, to body composition. I know we can get into both nutrition and training for that. Um, obviously, there's lots of overlap here, as you've talked about with health. But um, I want to, since we, I, I'm hoping to have about seven more minutes with you, if you're cool with that. Um, I would love to talk about sp some specific foods uh, because we have a lot of claims around like, for example, um, grains and gluten are terrible for you. Uh, eggs or egg yolks or red meat are terrible. Um, and, and also I wanna hear your opinion on keto. So I'll let you take those topics and you can decide which one you wanna address first. <laughs> sure. So there are some foods that offer just more numerically of things that are healthy than other foods. Uh, the parlance says they have a higher nutrient density. Uh, mostly when we talk about nutrient density, we're referring to vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, which are special kind of plant compounds that have a little small effects on health, but there's like 100 million of them, so they add up. To, again, a very small number, but uh, something that's meaningful. And, of course, fiber, which is very healthy in about 10,000 different ways and some significant ones. So if you have a food uh, that has a whole lot of those things in it, it's pretty objectively healthier on average than food that has less or has none of those things. The problem there is before you say, oh, my God, I'm going to eat a whole lot of that food. A good example is kiwi fruit. Like kiwis are loaded with vitamins, minerals, chemicals, and fiber. Unbelievable. Fruit, food of the gods, I tell you. The thing is um, fruits and vegetables and every single food also comes with a certain amount of irritants, pro-inflammatory agents, and allergens, and comes with an inherent monotony of consumption. Kiwis are amazing until you eat 10,000 of them, and then you swear you'll never eat a fucking kiwi again, pardon my language. So uh, when people look for magic foods, they have to consider that there's, you know, any food that you eat in excess is going to start to get, benefit you a ton, but also give you these problems of excess. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, it's going to be an issue of adherence where you're going to be on this magic food diet for a while eating only kiwis and lean ground beef and, you know, whatever, choose a healthy almonds or something, and then you're just going to be super healthy. Um, and you will. You'll be really healthy, right? But, uh, but you're just not going to be able to sustain that because you're just going to die of boredom at some point. It, 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 before you die of boredom, you're just going to start eating who knows what, and then you're going to stop eating the magic foods. And usually when people are on a magic foods diet and they step off of it, they don't step down to a balanced diet of diverse intakes. They step right off the thing and fall into the pit of just, you know, Oreos mixed with, with peanut butter and, you know, fried into pizza. Oh, shit, I should be a chef. I was, that sounds delicious. So, um, <laughs> So, so the magic food stuff is it's definitely true that there are some foods that are healthier than others, but there's nothing healthier than a wide variety of those foods uh, eaten uh, to taste and preference and occasion uh, and just mixing it in. So, so are, are there some lean, healthy proteins? Is salmon the healthiest fish? It doesn't really matter because there's five other fish that are almost as healthy as salmon, even if it's the healthiest or something, and they're great to rotate into your diet. Fish is actually a particularly interesting example because certain kinds of fish that are very healthy also have higher levels of mercury or PCBs or some other compounds, which over time can add up to really negative effects. But if you alter your fish intake, wild caught versus farmed, then you can obviate most of those effects. Um, so in the end, the magic foods thing or the special kinds of foods man, it really just kind of washes away. And the answer is, you know, there's a whole lot of foods in every single category, which is why those categories are important, you know, lean protein sources, fruits, vegetables. Like if you're getting a, different kinds of fruits, different kinds of veggies, different kinds of whole grains, different kinds of lean proteins, and different kinds of healthy fats, it doesn't mean you have to have every single part of your plate has to be a little different. It, you could eat the same stuff for a week and then different stuff for a week and then different stuff for another week. And every day, that week, the same stuff, you'll be super duper healthy. Just change it up a little bit, get some var variation in there, and you're super good to go. So I, is that a sufficient answer for the, the um, magic? Let me ask you real directly. So mm -hmm. in your analysis of the evidence, did you see strong evidence that indicates that grains or gluten or egg yolks oh, or red meat are significant drivers of aging and disease? 
Grains, absolutely not the opposite. Whole grain consumption is linked to everything magical. It's pretty much unicorn dust. It's amazing. Whole grains are amazing. Gluten is really bad if you have celiac disease. It'll kill you sooner or later. It's going to make you have chronic diarrhea until then. Uh, if you don't have celiac disease, it is almost certainly true that you can't even tell if there's gluten in your food. Um, it, there's a possibility that there's a, a very short spectrum of gluten. I want to call it even intolerance. You know, just not jiving with it. Um, but, but, but that's very unclear. It actually is probably 90-10 that it just doesn't happen, right? So the thing is, is when you feed people gluten and uh, they say they're gluten intolerant, none of them have celiac disease, um, they don't actually know <laughs> almost at all that you're feeding them gluten. They literally can't tell. And, and uh, a lot of times, this is actually really uh, very pertinent to your, uh, to your audience. I'm sure it'll be a very curious finding for them. I, I'm sure you're probably pretty aware of this. Those same folks that claim to be affected negatively by gluten, um, they actually fed them a diet designed to eliminate every known uh, irritant uh, to the gastrointestinal tract. And, and then they have a, another diet, another piece of food that has every known irritant in it. There was no difference between how much they complained about irritation of various sorts, but they complained excessively both times. And that's kind of like, that's definitely psychology at that point. It's a very, very high probability where people think their food is somehow poisoning them. And if you don't tell them that this one's not irritating, this one is, they just think, oh, I'm definitely having a bad response to this, a really bad response to this. And like one of them just had nothing in it that should be irritating you. And this one had everything in it that was irritating you. And you said they irritated you the same, right? So it's real bad. I, you know, I actually haven't seen that study. I would love to, to actually get a link. I'll to see if I can dig it up for you. This episode. Fascinating in a real depressing kind of way. You're like, holy crap. <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, so, in any case, uh, that kind of stuff, because, you know, the FODMAPs and other irritating foods have a lot of attention. And a lot of people really do have foods that they should be avoiding, but that's on a real individual basis, you know. So, I'm never going to tell someone that gluten is just absolutely golden and they're totally fine if they don't have celiac, eat it up. If you think gluten doesn't do you right, stop eating it or eat less of it. But if you honestly can't tell, you think it may be keep going it's totally fine um so glues grains are great actually is the opposite uh, gluten is is probably fine for 99 percent of all people and, um, and just just to clarify that point that there there is a link in the literature with refined grains and and poor health outcomes but whole grains are generally linked with better health outcomes correct because they have higher nutrient densities mm -hmm. because you overeating them is very difficult the link between refined grains and poor health when you uh, take away other controlled factors like smoking, uh, risk-taking behaviors, health prioritization, and high-calorie diets, uh, refining grains go down to about this much negative effect. So they by themselves practically don't do anything bad, maybe a little bit, uh, but it's really hard to tell once you take away everything else. It's the kind of people that tend to eat a lot of uh, refined grains also just pardon my language, just don't give a shit about their health to begin with. So they do 50 other things that are really bad. And the people, the kind of people that eat a lot of whole grains, I mean, you see them at whole foods and stuff, those that kind of people. And they worry when they come to the doctor and the doctor's like, I don't know why you're here. You've never been unhealthy. Get out of my office. Like, those kinds of people. Like, no, I know something is wrong, damn it. <laughs> so. Okay. So I have a big challenge for you. If, if like, and, and this is impossible, but I would love to get just like quick one line answers to red meat and egg yolks. Um, if you think those are significant drivers of disease, because I know there's obviously lots of vegan diet gurus that are convinced yeah. they're like the most terrible thing in the world. Red meat drives some kind of disease, prevents and is better for other kinds. On the net balance, maybe a tiny, tiny negative in the context of a whole big diet, nothing to worry about unless you've got every other horse lined up. Unless you're on the carnivore you know, diet and you're only <laughs> for sure, <laughs> then you got a lot of other problems, uh, mostly psychological ones, I assume. And then, <laughs> and then uh, egg yolks, um, man, you know, I haven't even heard that one. Uh, I've done the analysis, the evidence. Egg, egg yolks are one of the healthiest foods that you can eat. Uh, but well, you've, uh, you've certainly it, heard the whole like dietary cholesterol. Oh, no, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I should have phrased it. I haven't heard that one in like five years. Uh, it's hilarious that it's still around. Um, uh, you know, again, again, uh, if you're uh, high, high, really high levels of cholesterol, if it's been shown to you by your doctor that your own dietary cholesterol affects a lot, uh, which is really pretty rare, uh, then you may have an argument in the context of a diet. If you eat like tons of egg yolks, maybe you get, uh, the, the biggest thing about egg yolks is like when I go out to eat and I order an omelet, I usually order it with no egg yolks because I want more egg. 
Um, but uh, I don't want as many calories for fat. I mean, it's just calories. Forget the fat. Uh, so it's a great way to lower calories, but there's nothing uh, too magical about it being bad for you. Okay. Last, last thing, your thoughts on keto. And, in, and we can speak specifically in the context of health or you can introduce fat loss. But, and I know it's a challenge to maybe cover this in just a span of a few minutes, but just your quick, your, your quick thoughts. Sure. In the context of fat loss, keto is in part uh, effective, can be effective because it reduces appetite. For some folks, it does not, and then it is ineffective. Um, it, keto has a, so that's the so benefit of keto. In some individuals, it stops that sort of recursive consumption of carbohydrates uh, and thus calories. Um, and uh, another benefit of keto is that uh, it delimits highly palatable foods considerably. If someone's like, you got all night, baby, let's go out there and eat the world. You're like, let's do it. They're like, uh, no carbs. You're like, hmm. <laughs> yes, I'm staying in. <laughs> There's only so much ranch dressing you can pour on bacon and chicken until you're like, we're done here, right? So yeah. really tough to eat a lot of calories on keto. So potentially beneficial. On the a counter point to that, it's just very unsustainable because sooner or later you'll you'll somebody give you a cookie at a work party you'll remember what carbohydrate tastes like you'll just zap out because you it's just heroin like at that point as far as how good it makes you feel you'll you know wake up at a dumpster with you know severed clown heads and cookies and you have no idea how you got there the police will be asking all sorts of uncomfortable questions <laughs> I, it basically like you know a lot of people that people do strings of keto right? lose a good amount of weight and then they'll they'll get carbs back in there they'll go on a resort or they'll go on a work trip They'll take carbs again, and then they have, much to I think a lot of your philosophy, they have no hedonic control mechanisms around carbs anymore because it's just like free for all. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, they're just eating in excess, and they gain all the weight back, and they're like, I need to do keto again because carbs are the problem. Like, no, it's the fact that you're eating trillions of them because you sensitized yourself to their delicious effects. Um, uh, outside of that, so, so that's the, the, the keto, and I think that kind of balances out to like, the, sum, the summary is it's an effective dietary strategy for some individuals that can do it in the long term and for whom it works really well for appetite regulation. That being said, the, 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 uh, the physical process of ketosis, the molecular and chemical events in the bloodstream, so on, uh, have heretofore demonstrated zero actual health-improving or metabolically altering magical effects I mean, I don't see magical, just effects, right? People will like measure their pee and be like, I'm in ketosis. Like, hey, is there a handshake I can give you? You're the man. This, we're still looking for it. There's nothing magical about ketosis that anyone's found that makes you in any way healthier. If you're in ketosis and you're hypercaloric, you're eating too many calories, you'll be in every way very, very unhealthy, just exactly as unhealthy as you were, getting too many calories any other way. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's this idea of like, it's the ketosis. Like, no, it's the reduction in calories. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a lot of people focus on that. The biggest problem as a public health professional that I have, or when I used to be a professor, now I'm in private industry, but still very much passionate about public health, is that you don't want to recommend things that don't work for most people in the long term. So when I see people excited about keto, I think it's great. They get a sort of a habit of eating a lot of lean meats and maybe even fatty meats throughout the day. What I'll try to get them to do is add more green veggies into that. And they'll be like, okay, I feel great. And I'll keep losing weight and being healthy. And then I might ask them to eat a couple fruits every now, just raw pieces of fruit every now and again with their meals. And they'll feel just fine and even better because it's some carbs. You know, you're not going to go crazy eating fruit. And then weave in some whole grains maybe. And all of a sudden they're eating a great like, balanced diet and everything's awesome. Same with paleo. Like the paleo diet cuts out a crap load of foods that you can really eat. But it's fundamentally a real healthy diet. You just weave in the healthy versions of carbs back into paleo. A couple months later, you got somebody that, that's just eating a, a really well-balanced diet. So that's kind of my views on keto. Like if you're, if you're sort of pathologizing it, if you are just deifying it, putting it at a religious pedestal, you're doing a disservice uh, to your understanding of nutrition and probably to your health as well. Beautiful. Well, Mike, this has been an absolute pleasure and uh, content packed, which I would expect no less from you. So thank you so much. Um, we have to wrap up now, which is unfortunate because I would love to talk to you for two more hours and I know you have much more wisdom to share. I need to have actually you have to go to part two. I actually have to go to jujitsu soon to get beat up. So. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I, we definitely need to have you on again to talk about body composition and training. Um, but in the meantime, to close, where can people find more about your work and uh, what do you offer? 
So I help run a company called Renaissance Periodization. It's a really fancy name uh, for something that's really straightforward. We help folks lose weight, get healthy, get in shape, and look cooler, like they maybe want to look more muscular, less fat. And at RP Strength is our Instagram. That's a real good place for a lot of folks to get started looking at the pictures, transformations, diet stuff. We've got healthy eating guides. We've got programs to just tell you kind of what to eat, food categories you pick, and it gets you lean. We've got private coaching. You can work one-on-one -on -one with a, a professor or a doctor or a PhD that can help you navigate these lifestyle things, lose weight, so on and so forth, get healthy. And we have a ton of books uh, and, and all this stuff. So you, also have, strength, you also have workout templates, correct? We do, yeah, totally. I was going to save that for the next time you and I talk. But uh, workout templates uh, to get you in shape and build some muscle and get you healthy. And uh, we are, all that is at renaissanceperiodization.com. Don't bother with that. Just go to Instagram at rpstrength. Letter R, letter P, strength. It'll get you started, and there's clickable links in there to take you to the website and everywhere else you want to go. And if you're really curious about the details of the discussion we had today, uh, a book of ours, it's an ebook, easy to download, super cheap, understanding healthy eating, available at renaissanceperiodization.com. So if you go to RP Strength, you can find it, no problem. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mike. Really such a pleasure to have you on, and I'm going to connect with you uh, in the next couple of days to schedule part two. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.